thank you for the wonderful introduction. I do think about these things all day, um, much to my children's you know, dismay. Uh, I have been writing high performance web applications for a very long time. Uh, this is a screenshot of a talk I gave almost a decade ago uh, that includes a screenshot of an app I worked on at Netflix. So this uh, app, what it does, if you were able to watch the video of it, which there was a snafu even in this talk, um, it, uh, it ticks along and shows you in real time what's happening in Netflix's infrastructure. And this includes hundreds of millions of devices thousands and thousands of server instances, and at the time, all, more than half the bandwidth in North America. Uh, so this is a lot of data, and it's being displayed in a web browser, right? So I have had the privilege over the years of working with some very, very, very smart people, and they have taught me things. These are not things I've divined from anything. I have learned from some of the best people you could possibly work with, and there's a few simple things that I want to share with you today that I hope will change how you think about your code when you look at it and, and make it so you can identify issues and patterns the same way I can. So when I look at this code, this code is not great. This is, this is just random arbitrary example code. When I look at this code, I can instantly see where there could be potential problems, potential problems with thread lockup, potential problems with concurrency, um, all sorts of things. Like I, I can see issues where there might even be back pressure it, problems, and I'll, I'll explain what back pressure means here in a minute. And the reason I can see it is I see certain things instantly when I look at it. I can see the different actors on this stage, I can see what they're doing, if they're pushing or pulling, and that's what I want to talk about today. I see producers and consumers, and I see push and pull. Th these four terms will help you describe things uh, in your own code base, help you talk to other developers, especially more senior developers. This is a really important concept. So I have a live demonstration, and for my live demonstration, I am going to need Miss Jessica Sachs, who I believe is here. And Jessica, you're not allergic to peanuts, right? No, she, li she lives down the road from me. I, I know her quite well. So she's totally a plant. I, I could have picked any of you, but I, I planted someone in the audience. Now. For this live demonstration, I am going to struggle at opening this pack of M&Ms, the finest American chocolate, I might add. Um, and oh, here we go. Didn't spill them all over the floor. Great. All right. I washed my hands sometime today. Don't worry. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to be the producer, and I'm producing M&Ms, and you are going to be the consumer. All right? Okay. And we're going to demonstrate push and pull. So in order to consume these M&Ms, what you need to do <laughs> is you need to take one at a time, consume it, chew, swallow, and then take another one and do the same until okay. we're done. All right? So okay. you may decide when you want to because you're the consumer. You're in charge of this whole situation. I'm just producing M&Ms. Would you like another one? Uh, I would have to produce one too bad. If you tried to pull one right now, go ahead. Oh, look, there's nothing in your hand. That's horrible, <laughs> right? So that's pull. Pull was really great for Jessica being able to get the M&Ms when she wanted. I don't think she swallowed in between grabbing each one, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but you see, there was a problem with pull in that if I, the producer, don't have time to come over here and get one of these things and be ready, then when she goes to pull, it's not there. And this is when we start to need asynchronous code, right? Um, so let's do push-based for a second here. And so for push-based, I, the producer, am going to give you an M&M when I'm ready to give you an M&M. And you must consume it one at a time. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Here we go. <laughs> she's, she's actually a juggler, so that's, um, I, I was a little worried I might not be able to demonstrate this, right? So there's, <laughs> other than a cleanliness problem right now, that, that, that demonstrates the problem with, with, with push. So I, being push-based, I have time now as a producer. I could go back, I can get another M&M. I could build a whole M&M factory and make an M&M and give it to her. I have time to do what I need to do. However, if I deliver them faster than she, the consumer, can consume them, she, we run into back pressure issues. This is, a, this is a back pressure problem. So she, gets, she feels the pressure of, I have to eat these as quick as possible, and I'm getting backed up. I have too many M&Ms for me to eat, right? Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. So helpful. 
<laughs> All right. So that's, that's really it. That's the whole premise. That's, those, are the, those are the pluses and minuses of push and pull in the role of consumer and producer. And all of your code has this. They're the actors of push and pull. And don't get excited, CS nerds. I don't mean the actor model. These are just the, the your code is always either a consumer or it's a producer. The producer is usually a little hidden from what you're actually looking at in your code. So how do we identify consumer and producer? We can look at really normal looking code, like you know, everyone at work writes a get value method and logs it, right? So this is pretty normal code. And the consumer here is actually the value, it's where we're getting the value out and we're logging it, right? The variable side, the, the assignment side. So we return a value from the producer, which is our function. So this is, this is, a, this is pulling a value out of this function. This is producing a value to be used by the consumer. Similarly, we've all seen for loops before. With this code, what do you think? The body of the for loop is the consumer, and the producer is going to be your iteration, like the actual for loop and the iterable that are, that are giving you the values. Here, this one's a little different. This is mouse moves. Um, this one, the consumer is obviously the, the handler for the event the function, and the producer is going to be, you could say it's the body element, you could say it's you know, the event target, you could even say it's the user uh, moving the mouse. It's kind of a collection of these things. So consumers and producers in push versus pull. Pull, the consumer pulls or gets the value uh, right when they need it. It's very, very convenient, it's very easy to reason about, we see it all over the place. I mean, you all call functions, I hope. It's always synchronous. That's one of the reasons it's so easy to reason about. Push, on the other hand, is a little bit more complicated. Uh, this is when the producer gives you the value whenever, to whenever the producer is ready to give you the value, and the producer could be anything. This could be synchronous or asynchronous. Like, I could synchronously push you values. You could, you could you know, give me a call back and just give you stuff. Or, you know, maybe it's a web socket or who knows what. So pull types are these two things that you see all the time. You've got functions, which you pull a value out, a single value, there's always one return value from a function, even if you have a tuple, sorry, that's one value, you just took two. And then uh, iterables, which are very, very common. These are things like sets, arrays, um, maps, those sorts of things, and you iterate over them. Push types, on the other hand, look like this. You've got callbacks, which have been around forever. You've got promises, which are fancier, but there's still a callback in there, technically. And you've got observables, which, of course, is the library I work on, and they're coming, they're standardized. They, you actually use observables in different shapes more often than you think, um, which you have some sort of subscribe function, and you pass a callback to. So generally in JavaScript, uh, you can identify these. If I go back and I look, you can identify these by the fact that there's a callback function there, right? So you can do that except when you can't. And you can't when there's async await. This looks like synchronous code. You can't see the callback. Fortunately, most code highlighting highlights that await part pretty good. This is still pushing. This is not exactly uh, pull, but that await bit causes a push. But this is also kind of both, right? Because I am pulling a promise out of get value and then the promise then pushes the value to me, right? So this is a, this is, you're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this, this pattern. So this does do both. But what about stuff like this, right? I just said iterables are pull-based, but here's a callback. What is this? Well, this is both. For each is actually pushing values at you. And the implementation under the hood is pulling values out of that iterable. And you can, there's a difference here with when you do like a for loop and, and you have this, the for loop you can break. You can't break a for each. All right, so there's a slight difference there because of the push nature of what's going on. All right. So promises are rarely alone, right? They're, it's, it's not often that you're gonna be like, here's a promise, I'm just gonna make a promise and use it right now. Usually you're returning a promise from a function, almost always. So you pull and then you push. 
Observables, uh, if you haven't used them, they're a push-only collection of zero to n values. So they're kind of like an iterable, but they're pushing things at you instead of you pulling things out. Iterable is a push-only collection of zero to n values as well, and we consume it like this, and it, this adds a lot of sugar for this right here. Like, if you were to just do this with plain JavaScript, you'd be like, okay, so while this is true, we call next, we check to see if it's done in value, whatever. There's a lot of code. Just use four of, don't do this. That's weird. But um, iterable and, and observable are actually more complete contracts for push and pull. Uh, in, in all cases, you have this role, these roles of consumer and producer doing these four things. The consumer tells the producer when to start. The producer can tell the consumer when it's done providing values. And the producer can report errors to the consumer. I can't provide a value right now because something happened with the WebSocket or whatever. Um, the uh, consumer can tell the producer it no longer wants values. Break the loop, unsubscribe, whatever. And in a lot of ways, observable is the dual of iterable. A lot of people are very nervous about observables. I've seen what people do with RxJS. Um, yeah, it's, it's, that would happen if you used arrays near like flat map, flat map, flat map. It gets crazy, I get it. Um, but they're the dual of iterable. And what I mean by that is you can, you can kind of take everywhere you're pulling and flip it into a push or a push through or something. So here we start with an iterable and what an iterable looks like in JavaScript is this. You've got a symbol.iterator method and that returns an iterator which has a next method on it that returns an object that says whether or not you're done and the value. And we can make it less weird by getting rid of the symbol part so it has like an iterator method on it. And then the other thing that's strange is this, this shape of iterator on the bottom where you see it's got next and that returns an object with done and value, that's uncommon in most languages. Almost all languages have iteration or enumeration and in those cases they usually have one method where you say, do you have a next value? And another method where you say, okay, give me the next value. So it returns true, okay, give me the next one. So it does it in two steps instead of allocating an object. I could do a whole talk <laughs> about why that decision in JavaScript was weird. But if we wanted to make the dual of an iterator, we make an observer. And what we, what we do is instead of returning has next, we pass in has next, the Boolean, we push it through, right? And instead of returning the next value, we push the next value through. But has next is a little weird. You're not gonna be like has next true, here's the value, has next true, here's the value. You only really care about has next false. So we can change that to just be complete. That makes a little bit more sense. And now we have a pretty uh, full observer. There's one other thing it needs to be able to do. An iterator, when you call next, can synchronously throw an error to report there was a problem. The producer says, I have a problem, consumer. I can't produce this value. And in order to allow the producer to do that through an observer, we just need another handler. We need another error method to push the error through to the consumer. And then, the only difference there is instead of an iterable that has an iterator method that returns an iterator, we have an observable that has an observer method that takes an observer. But usually this is called subscribe in most observable implementations. And then the final thing that it's missing is with iteration, you can stop iteration by simply not calling next and it's synchronous and so you've got total control over when you iterate. Uh, so we need a way to stop observation, we need a way to tell the producer to stop sending values to the consumer for the consumer. And so what's usually done is the observable returns some sort of uh, subscription semantic or sometimes it could take an abort signal, that's what the, the W3C proposal is going to do. Um, but there's a variety of ways to say, hey, I the producer want to stop consuming this subscription. So you can see the duality if you really squint, you look, it's not that different. It, it's very much similar in a lot of ways. Um, there's duality also with just plain functions. Since you have a function that returns a value, you can have a function that takes a callback. It's, you, you push things out, it's the same sort of idea. Um, you need to report an error, so oftentimes in Node you'll see the first argument's an error. Sometimes it's like, well, what if a valid value is null or something? I, I think that's weird, they'll have a second argument that was the choice with uh, promises, right? The promise, on the other hand, doesn't really have a dual because it's so advanced, it does a lot of wrapping and unwrapping, it returns another promise after then. You can't really build a dual out of that. It's, it's a little bit, it's not as primitive as an observable. 
All right, so I'm gonna to start to build some quadrants for, for here of types that you deal with every day that you need to think about. One is pull, you use that all the time, functions and intervals. The other is push, you've got callbacks and observables, and I got promises kind of in parentheses there because they're never alone. And I'm gonna make this other quadrant here now pull push. So that is a function paired with a promise. So you call a function, it returns a promise, you're pulling, and then you're pushing, you're waiting for the push. There's another pull push type that you should know about, and that is async iterable. So async iterable is iterate, an iterable of promises, right? Basically. Uh, it looks a lot like this. You have an async iterator function, it returns an async iterator. The async iterator just looks, looks exactly like our other iterator, only it gives you a promise to that iterator result. You can create one in JavaScript right now by using async function star. How many people have used async function star? Like, like there's like, I don't know, maybe 10 of you, that's cool. It works, it's interesting. Um, you can consume one with four await loops. So this will wait till it gets to the top, pull that promise out, let it wait for it to resolve or reject, and then enter the body of that for loop, do whatever needs to be done in there. This is nice because if you're doing very slow work, like Jessica chewing her M&Ms, it gives her time to get back to the top of the for loop and say, okay, I'm ready for another M&M and I can produce one and she can handle it. So they're very good for back pressure. Async intervals are very good for back pressure. In fact, all pull then push types are very good for back pressure, for managing that issue which doesn't come up all the time, but when it does, it's gnarly. So, pull then push, you only request the data you, when you know you can handle it. So that rounds that out, but there's another quadrant here. Push then pull. And this is kind of a type de jour right now. We've got signals. And what are signals? Like you might have seen people talking about these. Signals have existed for a very long time, but now they're like, everything's old as new again, right? So they were also known as Ember Computed Props, Knockout Observables, not Observables, actually Signals, MobX Observables, not Observables, actually Signals, uh, SolidJS Signals, View Refs, Angular Signals, Spelt Runes, I don't know about that name, but it's cool, and then TC39 Signals, which I've been helping spec out lately. And what they kind of look like, and this is a vague shape, they could kind of look like this. You've got a subscribe where you can push whether or not something's changed, and then you've got a get to get the value out. So the producer notifies the consumer, hey, this has changed, and then the consumer, at its leisure, when it's ready, can get the value out. And what is this good for? Well, it's good for a lot of things. For one thing, you can delay computation of something expensive until you're ready to actually use it. So if you're updating something really quickly asynchronously, you can delay when you actually do that computation. It also is really advanced. Like this does things like, oh, this computed tracks that it depends on these and on signals A and B, and this effect tracks that it depends on signal C, which depends on A and B and so on. So you get this whole dependency graph to notify what's changed and what hasn't. Um, this is just one possible shape for signal. So the actual signal that you actually interface with is gonna look like this. It'll probably just have a get, and there'll be a state signal that you can kind of set and get. Uh, signals themselves, again, are much more complex than anything else that, uh, that I've talked about today. You can give a whole talk about the intricacies of the diffing logic and the dependency graph and that sort of thing. The proposal is here. I'll make sure that you all get the link to this. Uh, the proposal, this is actual code that you would be able to write in real-world JavaScript. The effect part would probably be implemented by somebody's framework. And that kind of rounds out everything. So this is really important, this, this uh, four-way chart here. Uh, pull is great for getting any synchronous value. Push is uh, it's great for event composition through observables, getting asynchronous values. Uh, and allowing the producer to just kind of give you things as quickly as it can. Usually push is great for anything asynchronous. Like oftentimes you're not gonna run into back pressure issues, but when you do, pull then push is great. It's more complicated because there's clearly two steps, but it's wonderful for that controlled delivery between services or something like that. And then finally we have push then pull. And what this is actually good for is those controlled reads of asynchronously updated values. So like a framework, you update a bunch of code, you don't want to calculate a bunch of stuff before you render, because render is expensive. 
that expensive action, you say, all right, right before this expensive action, now I'm going to read through all these things and do these computations, whatever, and, and actually render that. So there's a lot of other types you could add in here. Um, if you think about it, a lot of them are silly. Some of them are not. Readers, uh, you know, tasks, actions, that sort of thing. An iterable of observables, an observable of iterables, right? But I really, really just want to leave you all with this slide. This is, it, like, think about, you know, who's the producer, who's the consumer when you're looking at your code, and then look at the types that are being used and know what they're actually good for and where, where the problems could possibly be with those. So that's it. Uh, merci. Thank you.